Good morning. How is everybody? I told Suzanne, I said, now, it may sound a little hollow in the auditorium today. I said, we've got several out vacationing. So we're grateful that you're here. And those that are listening by way of extension cord, we won't mention Donna's name. <laughs> we appreciate them <laughs> as well. <laughs> but uh, we're glad that you're here. Any announcements that we need to make before we get started? Do remember this afternoon, 4.45, our meeting. And also, remember next Sunday is, uh, <laughs> excuse me, Fellowship Sunday. So we'll have church, and then we'll eat, and then we'll have church afterwards after we eat, and we'll be dismissed for the day. So remember that. and Come prepared. If you will. Also, uh, let's see what else is going on. All right. Well, I don't know a lot. I know Jerry's in a meeting this week at Brushy. If you get down to Centerville, <laughs> get down that way. You might look him up. And uh, that's it. As far as I, what I know, you're 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 caught up with me. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn to First Corinthians chapter seven. We're ready for verse twenty-five. 1 Corinthians 7 is one of the longer chapters in the book of 1 Corinthians. And it's dealing with the question. Uh, the first six chapters, Paul deals with present distress. Paul deals with uh, a problem in the, the church itself and uh, at Corinth and uh, how to handle that. And, and evidently they do handle that, but they... It's kind of sad that it took Paul getting, if you will, getting to the point of writing to them and telling them to straighten it out before they took care of it. When you get to the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul introduces such by saying, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. In other words, Paul begins to answer questions. And I, I've always leaned to the fact, and, and, and I may be wrong, but I've leaned to the fact that the rest of 1 Corinthians, while Paul may not necessarily say this is a question because he'll say concerning uh, the eating of meats in, in 1 Corinthians 8, he'll say concerning the things you wrote to me, and he answers that question. And so we do see, if you will, kind of trademarks of, of where he is answering questions. And and he's going to talk about several things because as a preacher, you always go off. A, a question will, will you'll get answered, but at the same time, too, you'll go off in a particular area. So I've always thought, and, and like I say, it could be wrong, and, and, and I don't think this is one of those things that just truly matters. But I've always thought that the rest of 1 Corinthians from chapter 7 on are answers to, to what to the church at Corinth wrote him. And so he answers their questions. Well, the thing that he begins with is is the idea of it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And so the question may have been, or questions, I guess, would probably be the best way of saying it, plural. The questions may have been in connection with marriage and, and, and being married and, st and, and things of that nature. Now, Paul is, is answering these things in connection with and in line to what is going on in the church and what's going on in the world at that time. There are things that are in his answer that are interesting, but basically uh, the, the, the couple of answers or the couple of thoughts that he gave that we looked at last week through the first 23 verses is that if at all possible, if an individual doesn't want to get married, doesn't have to get married, they don't have to get married. That's not a command of God. That's not what God expects. But if they so choose, there's nothing wrong with that. But Paul says, I would that you remain even as I. And so from that standpoint, Paul is, is telling them it's, it's all right to, to stay single. But if you want to marry, go ahead. And then he talks about, of course, keeping the vows, being faithful to one another, and how that uh, 
the husband is, is really he's he's owned, if you will, for lack of a better term, by his wife and his wife uh, is owned by the husband. And I don't mean that in a slavery sense. I just mean it from a standpoint of you, you have uh, with regards to the sexual relationship, you have you have uh, it says that you stay together. You have your your regular uh, times. And but uh, but then. If you want to abstain for a period of time, you do such with consent, and you do so for the period for that period for fasting and prayer. But then you, Paul says, you come back together again, unless you be tempted in your, uh, I like the old King James in your incontinency. He says, but then he says, with regards to verse 17, he kind of comes back to this idea of stay where you are, and uh, it'll be all right. All of this, as we said, is an in, is in an answer to at least one question, maybe more than one question about marriage and and who should be married. But as Paul addresses this issue, Paul will talk about beginning in verse 25, the unmarried and the widows, and what they should do and how they should should live, remembering that there is a present distress that Paul has talked about already in this book earlier. And thus, if you will, the world is upside down. Problems, problems not just within the church as there was, as we saw especially in, in the fifth chapter, but problems in the world. And so Paul is, is trying to take all of that into consideration And so let's begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25 is where we are, as he gives advice to the unmarried. Now concerning virgins, the word virgins here means young, unmarried, sexually pure. I have no commandment from the Lord. Now, he's not saying, okay, I'm doing this on my own. I'm saying this on my own. Because ultimately, as he'll talk about in this book, and as he's already made mention of earlier, uh, he says that he has the Spirit, God. In other words, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and later on in the 14th chapter, he, he's basically saying, what I have, I'm giving by way of God. But what he's saying here is, is what I'm about to say, God didn't tell me that this is, this is what to say from the standpoint, not that it's uninspired, it is inspired, but he's saying this is not something God laying as out as you would think of. Yet I give judgment on one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress. Now, like I said, we don't know what this this adverse condition is. It's really unknown to us that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you've not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she's not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in flesh, but I would spare you. Paul says, look, here's here's what you need to know. He says, with regards to, to an individual, if you're married, stay married. Now think about this. Let's think about it from a couple of different avenues. An individual is married, but they're not a Christian. And they're converted to Christianity. One of the things that is difficult for some to to grasp hold of and some to agree with is the idea of, okay, can I have fellowship? Because interestingly enough, the idea of fellowship is really going to come up as we deal uh, later on in this book, can I can I stay with my spouse? Because I'm supposed to come out from among them and be separate. Second Corinthians chapter three. I'm supposed to be an individual that is different from the world. Can I associate with the world? Well, of course you can. Of course you can. It's kind of interesting to me those that take that stance that you can't. The question comes then, how do you convert anybody? Because you can't talk to them, you can't deal with them, you can't have business with them, you can't associate with them. Oh, well, we hadn't thought about that side of the coin. So the question, though, that would arise, okay, 
you're converted, but your spouse isn't. What do we do? Well, Paul says, it's all right. Stay married. He first of all says, he says, now, he says, if a virgin marries, it's all right. But she says, he says, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. And so he's really saying in this paragraph, let the married and the unmarried remain as they are, considering the present distress. There's no sense in, in dividing. There's no sense in divorce. There's no sense in separation. And he says, but I say this, brethren, the time is short. Time probably here goes back to the idea of, in verse 26, the present distress. Some have said Paul's talking about the end of time. Some have said Paul's talking about his death. And, and yeah, there's, there's legitimate arguments on all sides of those three discussions. But probably Paul is just saying, look, you know, let, let's just understand time itself is short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as those should be as though they had none. Now, here's, here's the problem. Paul's not saying neglect your spouse. Go on and see what he says. Those who weep as though they do not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it from the form of this world is passing away. Paul is not saying, let's neglect our spouses. Considering the present distress, Paul's not saying, hey, but Paul is acknowledging and trying to impress upon the church at Corinth that your number one relationship is the Lord. My relationship with the Lord is more important than my relationship with my wife. That does not say that my relationship with my wife is not important. This is the most important physical relationship that I have, my wife. I will not neglect her. I will not not uh, uh, support her. I will not be around her. I will not uh, leave her. We made a commitment almost. We got, let's see, another week and a half. Yeah almost two weeks, 40 years ago. And we made a commitment to each other. Now, we were we were engaged for a long time. We were engaged for two years. We were engaged for two years. We dated for four before that, so we dated for six years altogether, I think is correct. She's not looking like this, so I'm close. <laughs> so, so I'm close. So... But when we we were kids, we were out of college. That was the that was the only requirement my parents had. Suzanne's folks said, "Oh, please take her." <laughs> but no, our folks said, "You know, get out of college." So we did. Uh, she wasn't through. I was. But uh, but nevertheless, we made a, a commitment before a bunch of folks, for a preacher, and before God, and we tend on staying with that. Like I say, it's been 40 years, and so we we tend on doing that and staying with that till as Romans 7 addresses the idea, till till death do us part. Now, considering the present distress, and like I say, we don't know what that was. Not only is there this idea of separation, but we have to ask who and what is most important. It's not our physical relationships. Our children are important, yes. Our spouses are important, yes. Our, our parents are important, yes. But our relationship with God is what's most important. And when we begin to neglect that relationship, that's when we have trouble. And so Paul says here, he says, he says I want you to understand that you remember who's important. And then he says... But I want you to be without care. The word care there has the idea of anxieties. The question that arises amongst some is, 
when he talks about, I know I want you to be without anxieties. Is he talking about in the marital state or in the present distress? Or is he talking about both? Well, it seems as if he's saying that, okay, there's a distress. Families need to know what's important. Here's what's important with regards to, notice what he says. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the world, how he may please the Lord. I'm going to get in trouble with this, but I'm going to say it. Single people have more time than married folks. You might say, no. We have 24 hours in a day just like you do. Yes. But an individual that has never married does not have the same responsibility, too. They're basically responsible only for self. Whereas married the individual is responsible for self and for their mate and children. And so Paul is, is trying to, to deal with this with regards to the unmarried, especially now in this paragraph. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look, you've got time to dedicate to the Lord. You've got a little more time to dedicate to the Lord. And really that becomes your responsibility. I mean, kind of make an application this way. I've often said that that being an elder, of course, I was an elder's kid. I've worked with elders for 40 years plus. That being an elder is very difficult. And, and here's why. It's not a matter of trying to keep everybody happy. It's not a matter of trying to satisfy everybody or even make the right decisions. All that's part of it. But an elder has to deal with the fact he has a job, usually. He has a family that he has to take care of, and then he has the church family. Whereas a preacher, can, if you will, put that with a preacher, preacher has what? He has his job, which is the church, and then he has his family. He only has two obligations, whereas an elder has three, which makes it more obligations really he has than the rest of us. So now think about that and, and Put that over with regards to the marriage. You're married, got obligation, of course, to family, got obligation to the spouse, whereas single, just obligation to self. And I think that's what Paul is addressing here. And he says, but he who is married carries about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. She who is married cares about the things of this world, how she may please her husband. And this I say to your own prophet, not that I may put a leash on you. That's an interesting concept, which if you want to get down to personal preference, I don't like that word because it sounds more like, you know, he's not, he's not degrading people. But it sounds like it, a leash. But anyway, he says, he says, I say this for your prophet, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So once again, he's getting to this idea of, of let's, let's remember what's important. You know, what's important is our relationship to the Lord. Now, we've said a lot. Anything anybody wants to say, the thought still continues, a little different paragraph, but uh, anything anybody wants to say or ask. Brad. So in verse 36, he says, But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he'll keep his virgin does well. So then he he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. Still this idea. He's just running over it again. It, uh, Paul, Paul gets lengthy. The idea of staying unmarried is better than, than being married. Let's go on. Verse 39. Verse 39 is the one that has... Uh, 
well, verse 39 and 40, has, has thrown people through the years. And I've changed on what I think it is, and, and I'm not saying I'm right now. But uh, it, it's, it's one of those that has been debated and argued through the years because as we, we move in our society towards um, marriages that do not last for whatever reason, for whatever the reason may be, we have to find justification for the things that we do. And we have to be very careful in, in such. We have to be sure that, that we follow the scriptures. And so uh, folks ha have taken things and have taken scriptures and taken them out of context and taken them too far in, in many of the, the arguments, if you will, that are made instead of letting scriptures speak for themselves. But here's the problem, I think, with verse 39 and 40, as, as it's argued. It's, it's, we're not really told. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's look at it. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Now, let's look at everything except the phrase only in the Lord. We understand that. We understand that marriage is, is was intended by God to last for a lifetime. Now, Matthew 19, 1 through 9, especially Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, and to a degree, Romans 7 could qualify in this conversation for these verse, or this verse, is the fact that God allows marriage, uh, for divorce. And certainly we understand the allowances there that are made in those verses with regards to if um, your spouse is unfaithful to you or uh, you might say, well, what about in in times of where there's abuse, physical abuse or verbal abuse, thus mental abuse? Would God allow for divorce? And the answer is yes. We have to understand, based on Matthew 19, 9, and Matthew 5, 31, 32, the real sin in divorce comes not in the divorce, but in the remarriage, as far as who can remarry. When we ask ourselves, when we get down to a list, well, who can marry? Of course, Paul says here in Romans, or in 1 Corinthians 7, the virgin. The young, the young person that has uh, been sexually pure, that has not been married, can marry. The widow who's lost her or his mate can remarry, according to, to especially Romans 7, but also according to this passage. Why? Because the, the bond is no longer there because death has ended the bond. But then the third group that can remarry are those that have the scriptural right to remarry. And those would be the innocent party, <clears throat> according to Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> Excuse me. But now we get to the idea of widows. Well, who can marry? Notice that Paul says, you're bound to your husband as long as he lives. But if he dies, you're at liberty to marry whom she will. But who's the widow to marry? Because there's a little phrase there at the end, only in the Lord. What does that mean? It's not so much the phrase itself, what it means. The phrase itself, uh, you go back and you look at it, is used from the standpoint of Christians, children of God. Now here comes the question. Can widows only remarry Christians? Now I'm going to I'm going to throw out both sides. Okay? So so don't shoot at me yet. <laughs> there are those that say that the widow can only marry a Christian. That only in the Lord means Christian and so and we could look at at several verses and and say yeah, it does and say okay. So her husband we're going to use female her husband dies. She can only remarry a Christian. Why? Well, this verse says she can only marry one who's in the Lord. And in the Lord means child of God. 
why would Paul do that? Why would the Lord do that? Well, you might say concerning the present distress, concerning the obligation with regards to, to the women and, and their role and their importance in the church and their importance is far, far exceeding with regards to being Christian. So thus, thus as the argument goes, uh, Paul has said the widow can only marry a Christian. The second side, the other side of the coin, if you will, looks at this verse and says, okay, only in the Lord can be used with regards to the idea of in accordance to the will of God. And you could look at passages, uh, probably the best one is Revelation 14, verse 13. Where, where John writes there, blessed are those who die in the Lord. And we ask ourselves then, or the individual says, thus what Paul is saying is, is the widow must be under the obligation, if you will, of being in that list of who can scripturally marry in accordance to the Lord. That seems to make some more sense to me. My wife is agreeing because we've had this argument a long time. I've I've pushed her in a lot of ways on this this issue because I I, I used to hold the other I hold this position now that that a widow has a right to remarry if she qualifies if she's of course, she's not a virgin, so we understand that. So if her spouse or if um, maybe not, her, we shouldn't say her spouse, if she is her, well, her spouse dies. We'll get it right in a minute. Her spouse dies. That bond is broken. She's not a virgin. She's a widow. Matthew 19 doesn't apply because there was no divorce. So she has a right to remarry. Now, she may choose not to remarry, but this verse is not dealing with that. It's dealing with the idea of remarriage. Here's the answer from the standpoint of, of the difficulty, and I think individuals have to pick. And that is this phrase, whether it's used as an adjective or adverb, what does it modify? And that's the argument that has been made through the years. So, my belief is, is that what Paul is saying here is she's at liberty. She's free to marry as long as she can scripturally remarry. And like I say, the other verses then, the Matthew passages apply, I think, with regards to that. Verse 40, and then we'll open it up. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. In other words, he says, I think God's on my side on this one. She might be happier if she stays like she is. Uh, I didn't ask Suzanne if I could do this, so I'll just go on and do it and get forgiveness later. Suzanne's grandmother. <laughs> there was reasons for her saying this, but when Suzanne's grandfather passed away, Suzanne's grandmother, she was, of course, she was older. She had no interest whatsoever in any man. But she, she said, there's worse things than being alone, Paul. And she would point to, there was a, a case in the family where an individual remarried, and it was not good. And she said, you remember? Yes, ma'am. And she says, Paul, it's just sometimes it's better just to be alone. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so sometimes that's the case. And I, I, whenever I read verse 40, I think of, I think of Suzanne, as she called her mammy, I called her Mildred or well, I call her a lot, <laughs> but but uh, but uh, Suzanne's mammy. I always think of her when I read verse forty. All right, having said all that, <laughs> what do we have to say? Distress. Yeah. So here comes one of those great questions. What's the distress? 
to be honest, we're all under distress all the time, aren't we? <laughs> Well, if you go back to First Corinthians, First Thessalonians, excuse me, First Thessalonians, chapter four, and chapter five, he talks about the end of time, and he makes the statement in, in chapter five that it would be as a thief. I, I think he used, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, he used the word short, but short's relative term, shortly, you know. Shortly to a child is, you know, within the next five minutes. Shortly to an adult is, if I can muster up the energy within the next two or three hours, <laughs> I'll get there. And so, yeah, that, I don't really know that I have a specific answer for that off the top of my head, Jim. That's a good question. I don't really think I have a, a good answer for that off the top of my head. I do know that, it, like I said, I know he talked about the second coming. I do know he talked about it being thief, but if he made reference to it coming shortly, I don't recall. Yeah, the idea, and 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 here's the problem for me, for me, with the the argument. And Jim is right. There there are those that believe that whatever the present distress was, that once it's gone and that all of the regulations of 1 Corinthians 7 do not, do not apply. Well, first of all, that causes me some concern, but yet it doesn't cause me con some concern. It causes me concern because what we're basically saying then is that we can determine what we want to determine out of scriptures. In other words, we can pick and choose what we want to pick and choose. And we can say, well, 1 Corinthians 7 doesn't apply because we're no longer under the present distress. Okay. What did Paul really limit in 1 Corinthians 7? Well, he said basically, stay like you are, it's all right. God's your number one priority. And then he tells widows to remarry as long as you do so in a way that uh, is in accordance to the will of God. Take the other side of the coin and say, well, okay, you remove it with regards to, to present distress. You can remove other things, but why would God keep this here for us even today? Why, why would God have preserved these scriptures? Oh, there's something there in my thoughts that God must have wanted or he would not have preserved it for us today. And so I believe you have to hold to the principle that while he was dealing with the things with marriage with regards to the present distress, that those things that he talks about are still binding upon us today. That's my thought, but that's the argument. That's both sides of the argument. Good point. Good question. Anything else? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, y yes and no. <laughs> In Matthew 19, Matthew 19, 9 says, Whosoever puts away his wife, saving for the cause or except for the cause of fornication and marry another commits adultery. Let's say in... Boy, I want to make sure I word this correctly. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody. Let's say in our in our golden years, there's the word I'm looking for. In our golden years, our spouse passes away. And we find an individual that has been married before. 
Can they remarry? There's the question. We can remarry. We, we, uh, I'll, put it on, I'll put it on my terms. Suzanne passes away. Maybe this will be easier. Suzanne passes away. Who can I marry? Well, first of all, can, can I marry? And the answer is yes. Why? Because she passed away. Heaven forbid. We can't let this happen. But anyway, <laughs> who can I remarry? I can remarry anyone that's been married before. Yes. If. If, number one, their spouse has died as well, they're free to remarry. Number two, what about if they've been divorced? Matthew 19 would come into play. They can only, the individual that has been the innocent party is the one that can remarry. At any age, to be honest, not just in our golden years, but at any age. The guilty party cannot remarry. In other words, so if, once again, we'll put it on, on our terms, if Suzanne and I have gotten a divorce, and our divorce is because she's got red hair and I just don't like red hair anymore, which isn't true, evidently. I gravitate towards redheaded people. I've noticed that. Have you noticed that? I do. I don't know what my problem is. <laughs> anyway, I like red-headed people. Well, I like everybody. But anyway, Suzanne and I get have gotten a divorce. She was unfaithful to me. She went out and had an affair. We got a divorce. I'm the innocent party. I can remarry, whether she's dead or not. Now, According to the way I read Matthew 19, she can't because then she commits fornication. Well, adultery, actually. Well, she's committed fornication, yeah. She would have committed adultery if she remarries. So, so as a, a widow, okay, I can remarry somebody, A, that spouse has died. B, and we should really put this as A, never been married before. C, they're the innocent party in a divorce. D, this is one that's usually not thrown in. She had an affair on me, but I die. Can she remarry? The answer is yes, in my opinion. Why? Because the marriage bond was broken at death. And there's no longer the ability, the opportunity to reconcile one with another. That's where I stand on the issue. And that's what I believe. Hopefully, that clears, clarif clarify that for you. Anything else? This gets to be real sticky. That's why you. That's why I have to. I want to be sure that I I use my words correctly, and I'm not. It's not that I. It's not that I don't know what I believe. I know what I believe, but I want to make sure because it gets real sticky. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We we'll run through the list, and, and this is this is what, in my opinion, before I directly answer your question. In my opinion, this is what only in the Lord is referring to in verse 39, according to the dictates of God. Okay. So you're divorced. Your, your mate was unfaithful to you. You can remarry, number one, a person that's never been married before. Number two, you can marry a person that a spouse has died. Number three. You can marry a person who's been divorced as long as they are the innocent party. Their mate cheated on them as well. Yeah. I will say this. It's, boy, I just keep digging holes, don't I? It's very 
important, in my opinion, that if my, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, my relationship with the Lord is number one priority, that I want to marry someone of like faith. You know, now I would want to do it because it'd be hard for a congregation to hire me if my wife's going off to a denomination somewhere. <laughs> but, um, you know, First Peter 3, Peter talks about winning your mate by your, the old King James uses the word conversation, your, your, the way you conduct your life. Uh, I, believe the way, I believe the word is conduct in, for, in the new King James. And so uh, do you have to marry a Christian? I don't think so, but I, I think it is far, far, far better that you do. Well, those were 100 classes, so yeah. Paul's business one. Which was someone who had the right to marry in the gospel. And I came out of there and I was telling Paul, you won't believe what I, and it's this and this and this and this. And he's like, no, no, that's not right. And I'm like, well, yes, it is. <laughs> and I guess we disagreed for a long while till you came around to my way. <laughs> she wore me down. Yes, yeah, she wore me down. <laughs> I do, I do. Uh, she mentioned Winford Claiborne. Winford is dead now. Um, you will not find a man that was smarter than Winford Claiborne. He did not have his PhD. Winford only had a master's degree, but Winford had had a business for years. Uh, he had sold insurance, but he had a sporting goods business and was quite successful when he went to Fried Hardeman to teach. Uh, he read, I don't know how many books a week he read. And he is the individual that you've heard me make reference of. The present day situation with regards to morals and what's happening in this world is exactly what Winford Claiborne was telling us in 1980, 81, 82, 83, and 84 as I sat through his classes. Was going to what's going on and was going to happen. It's kind of interesting. 40 years later. What Winfrey Claiborne knew is so true. Uh, he was magnificent. He taught. He had this. He had this radio voice, and he was a fantastic man. And he was very intelligent. And Sue's didn't fare real well right at the beginning in the sophomore level class, but she learned. I know. I said you learned. Winford was fantastic. I got A's in all Winford's classes, but that's all right. You know, I'd take his test. Well, anyway, hopefully that clears that. This, like I say, divorce is is really sticky because I remember a lady in church, not here, not here, long time ago. She she basically made this statement. She said she was talking about another couple, a young couple getting married. And she says she says, well, they can get married. She's. And I thought, well, yeah, you know, they're like 19 years old. She said, if it doesn't work out, it's all right. Well, no, it's not. It's not in God's sight, first of all. And second of all, it's not with regards to 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 feelings and emotions and, and things that go into play way down the road that people that like me that help folks and sit with them and cry with them and hold their hands and try to help them through have to go through. So, no, it's it's not. But it does happen. Um, 19, I forgot the year. 
but there's a year somewhere in the, I want to say 80s, maybe it was even before that, where 50% of marriages in Nashville ended in divorce. And so it's, it's reality. Anything else? Sure. That's why you have to be very careful who you marry. Um, as we get our golden years, it probably becomes more precarious than it does even in our younger years. So I've made a pact with Suzanne. If we'll just grow old together, if she dies before I do, that's good enough. I've, I've finished. And Suzanne said, I'm definitely finished. <laughs> She's told me that. So, <laughs> uh, anything else? I think I think the relationship with the Lord's number one. I think you have an obligation to try to make it work. To to forgive. Yeah. But but it may not work out. I mean, that's a trust issue that's broken. I'm thinking of a couple now. She called me one Saturday afternoon. Suzanne and I were at the house and she had called her husband. I don't know that she at that point caught her husband with another woman, but she'd found another woman's hair in the bed. Well, what I was going to say was she she this this lady had a right to to divorce her husband because he admitted and and uh, they didn't get a divorce. They worked it out, but then later on they got a divorce. She she can divorce him. She can divorce him, but. I also think here, come, here comes something into play that is not discussed when this is discussed, but I think this comes into play, and I've thought about this for quite a while, and this is a difficulty. That trust bond is broken, but there's a forgiveness issue that has to happen. So the divorce may come, the marriage may end, but Forgiveness still has to be extended. And, and that's a process. We have to understand, we have to remember, forgiveness is a process. We can't forgive overnight. God can. We can't. I, well, I wish God had made us that way, but he didn't. And, and that's fine. And I think he understands that we have to work through it. But forgiveness has to be extended. And that's, like I say, that's something that's not forgiven or, or mentioned in discussions. Adultery is when two individuals that are not, that are married in this, I'm, I've oversimplified this definition. Adultery is when two individuals are, that are maybe married in the sight of the law of the land, but not in the sight of God, but are married. That's when, that's adultery. Fornication is, at least it's defined as pornania, is at least the sexual activity between two individuals.
Anything else? A lot of questions, I know. Uh, if you want to talk to me further in, in, in privacy, I'll be glad to, to talk with you and give you what I think. And I still believe, and, and I still try to help people this way. I try to give you what I believe, but I also try to give you scripture so that you can go make your own decision because it's up to you as well. Uh, we start next week then, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, meets offered idols concerning the questions. Paul will answer that. Thank y'all. Y'all have a great week.